Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Bob Rose. I am your host for this evening, and we'll be doing the introductions of our guest speaker this evening. And uh, <clears throat> I think you're going to enjoy tonight's presentation. This is number three in the series, and uh, it's uh, <clears throat> about the Great Spencer Fire of 1931, how it shaped our attitudes and how it affected our community. When you have a disastrous fire that burns about half of your community downtown business, uh, it's serious. But the response was tremendous. And uh, this book <clears throat> was written by Julie Schmidt, and she did it in 05 and 06, because 06 was our 75th anniversary of the fire. And we had a, <clears throat> a small celebration. Uh, I think it was in conjunction with Flagfest or, or close. But anyway, just recognizing the uh, things that happened in, in 1931. This year is the 91st anniversary of the Spencer Fire. <clears throat> and this book is a great account of what happened, who was involved, and how it has shaped our attitude and our future. And it is with great pleasure that I am able to introduce our speaker for the evening. The author of this book, Conflagration, and please join me in welcoming Julie Schmidt. Thanks, Bob. Hi, everybody. I'm Julie Schmidt. Uh, thanks for coming in tonight. We'll hope that the weather doesn't do anything uh, difficult while we're here. I don't know who's in charge of looking out the window while I speak. but. Uh, Anyway, um, yeah, I'm here to talk about the, this, this book I wrote in 2005 and 6. Um, I want to remind you that was 16 years ago, so um, <laughs> all that inf the information that's in this isn't as clear in my head anymore, so I've had to review a little, so I, I'll try to tell, tell this story again to the best of my recollection with some notes. Um, but yeah, today's, today's or tonight's uh, presentation is really a you know, a telling of the story, um, and uh, I will try to keep it um, you think 45 minutes and then have some questions at the end. Um, well, somebody told me that, but you know how that happens. People start kind of easing themselves out of the room. And, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I will say I also haven't timed myself, so we'll see. You know, feel free to say, move along if, uh, if it's getting, if it's getting uh, boring. So, okay, so as Bob said, I wrote this book in, in uh, six for the 75th anniversary. Um, uh, Spaceboard um, was so kind to support me in the publishing of, of this book, um, and they, they actually own the, the rights to the book and the, the sales of that. But uh, it was a fun project at the time. I, I did it um, kind of, I'd helped a little on the research for the historic district nomination. I'd done some library research, and the, um, the consultant at the time said, you know, somebody should write this story. This is a great story. Um, so I raised my hand, and Space said they'd um, publish it, and that's how it came to be. Um, okay, so um, I'm thinking most of you know the story of the Spencer Fire, or think you know the story of the Spencer Fire, but uh, um, let's see. See how I do on this? Switch on the side. <laughs> and that's why Alec is here. All right, this is a picture of Spencer's Main Street before the fire of 1931. So um, to, to um, yeah, 
slide too. Anyway, the, to open this up, this is the story of the events that took place in the small Iowa town of Spencer in the summer and fall of 1931. On a hot and windy afternoon on June 27th, 1931, a careless act started a fire that would burn down much of the downtown business area in about four hours. Some thought it would be the end of this community of 5,000. Yet despite being in the throes of the Great Depression, the community built itself back bigger and better, starting to work the very next day. So, um, so the summer of 31, a few other things were going on, even again, so we were in the throes of the Depression. Um, the grandstand out at the fairground was being constructed. Um, there were negotiations underway to build our post office, um, which is, you may remember, um, last had the Bogan Reef uh, studio in it, um, and there was um, a hospital fund drive underway to build the origins of our um, Spencer Hospital on West or East 11th Street. Um, also underway was uh, the construction or the paving of highways 18 and 71. They were soon to not be gravel anymore and going to be paved with concrete. So things were happening, even though it was the Great Depression. Um, also in June of or the summer of 1931, um, Iowa and much of the nation was under a heat wave. Um, in nine days, um, they'd lost 100 lives in Iowa um, and 300 people nationwide um, during this heat wave. So the, the fields were dry, the livestock were dying, and there were grasshoppers in the Dakotas headed our way. So that sets the stage. Um, <laughs> Um, also, um, there's an article, a small article in the Spencer Reporter from that the week before that says that officials at the Spencer's light and power, light and water plant were considering the purchase of a new pump for the city's water mains. Um, the current ones were still functional, but they were from the 19, the teens, and they were suspecting that the water, they might not be providing enough water pressure for the town. Those pumps had not yet been purchased. Um, so that sets the scene. Um, mayor W. H. Lewis was the mayor at the time. He'd been the mayor. He was the mayor in Spencer from 1930 to 1936. He was known for campaigning um, for the betterment of Spencer at both the state and local level. Um, he often led delegations to Des Moines to argue for Spencer's um, needs. And um, on June 25th, 1931, he also issued a ruling that states. It shall be unlawful to set off or fire any squibs, firecrackers, fireworks, or gunpowder in any place except upon his own premises unless by written permission of the mayor, limiting the time of such firing. Now, therefore, I, W. H. Lewis, mayor of the city of Spencer, designates the time of offering for sale and the setting off of firecrackers and other combustible explosives as follows, beginning June 27th and continuing until midnight July 4th. So he had restricted the number of days that fireworks could be purchased, um, but clearly didn't make any restrictions about how many fireworks could be offered for sale. So, all right. So this is um, the west side of Main Street, the site of Bernstead Drugstore. Um, some of you may know it as the Hen House um, now at 4th, 4th and Grand, but that's what the Bernstead Drugstore uh, looked like in uh, June of 1931. All right, so um, here's the interior of the drugstore before the fire. Um, what you should know is uh, down the middle of this store, if you can believe it, is on, on June 27th is a table about four feet wide by nearly 40 feet long, holding the largest stock of fireworks that the Bernstead Drugstore had ever carried for the 4th of July, worth about $300. The temperature was 97 degrees and winds were out of the south southwest at 25 to 35 miles an hour. So, um, so here we are in the store at approximately 3.35 p.m. Saturday, June 27th. Um, we've got Otto Bernstead Jr., this 18-year-old son of the owner, Jeanette Bernstead, the 25-year-old daughter of the owner, Ed Bernstead, pharmacist, brother of the owner, Clerk Mary Nelson, Associate Andrew Wallstrom, his 13-year-old daughter, Margaret, Bookkeeper Virginia, John Shelmadine, age 19, and William Skinner, all employees of the store. Um, there's a couple of, um, couple of customers, um, 
depending upon which account you read, there's, there's a half a dozen customers in the store. So um, anyway, the, the July 2nd, 1931 Spencer News Herald reports that a small dark-haired boy and two others entered the store to buy fireworks. The sale of fireworks had just started that day under the city ordinance. Miss Mary Nelson, clerk in the store, was waiting on them and the boys were handling various items. It was reported that the boy had a lighted punk, a device used to, to start to light fireworks in his hand and childish curiosity got the better of him and he touched it to a rainbow flame sparkler. It flared up and the boy dropped it in confusion just as Andrew Wallstrom was standing behind the prescription window shouted, good God, drop that. Um, there's another, there are other accounts um, um, that he wanted to know if the sparkler was a punk and someone lit it to show him how it worked. He got excited and dropped it in the display. That's another version of the story. All accounts agree that the ensuing explosion of fireworks display was fast and fierce. It was heard all over the city and rocked the immediate sound surrounding area. Um, a huge cloud of blue colored smoke burst from the side window of the store, followed by a sheet of flame that seemed to devour the entire structure. Detonating aerial bombs, firecrackers, and spiraling balls of fire shot from the building and skipped across the pavement. So that's the first blast from Bernstead Drugstore. Um, other stories, there were a uh, man in outside um, on Grand Avenue in a car with his son, and they hit the, hit the floor of their car thinking that there, the, there were gunshots. Um, Dr. Carl Collister, who was practicing above the Farmer's Bank, which is now where Dermis and Edward Jones is, he had been newly deputized. He ran out of his exam room and got a shotgun and thought that the bank was being held up. Um, <laughs> And uh, customers from all the customers, employees ran from the Bernstead drugstore. Um, okay, so let's see what's next. Oh, not yet. So anyway, inside the drugstore, Otto Bernstead is is trapped briefly and um, suffers some some burns to his face and hands trying to get out of the store. Um, John Shelmadine is downstairs. 19-year-old John is downstairs in the sort of paint and hardware part of the store. Um, he is trapped for longer um, trying to get out because the stairway is immediately on fire. Um, he does eventually get out um, a loading, I guess a loading entrance in the back alley um, and survives. Um, what else? Um, yeah, by this time the main stairs had collapsed and he, he was trying to get out of the basement um, and also trying to get through a partition that was between the basement of Bernstead Drugstore and a hardware store next door. All right, and upstairs from Bernstead Drug is the Spencer um, Telephone Exchange. It's the Northwestern Bell Telephone Company Exchange. There are six operators and their chief, Marie Banning, uh, a couple of linemen, and the uh, wire chief, Sam Harris, who also happens to be a volunteer fireman. Um, they hear the, the boom, the um, uh, Morgan uh, Cornwall, who's also got a law office with his brother um, next door, runs in, tells him there's a fire downstairs. Um, they dismiss all the operators. They, they tell all the operators and a couple administrators to, to leave as quickly as possible. And Marie Banning and two operators stay up there and begin calling for help um, because they know that once the exchange burns, um, Spencer's not going to have phone service anymore. Uh, and by the way, they've got a brand new $75,000 telephone exchange that uh, they've just installed. Um, so anyway, um, so Marie Banning um, and her two operators make as many calls as they can. The flames are climbing fast and furious. The place is getting smoky. Um, the two linemen are getting the screens and things taken off the windows so that they can escape by the window um, when they have to and they are rescued um, on the side of the building, out the side window. So that is the, you can see the front of the building to the right, and uh, um, that's where they're climbing out the window. Um, uh, Marie Banning would later say, um, at the time we left, the heat was intense and black smoke filled the room. I did not feel afraid and the other girls did not appear to be. Everything happened so suddenly there was no time to be afraid. But uh, they did risk their life to, to make calls uh, for help for area fire, fire departments to come. All right, so 
across the street then to the south is um, again where the Farmers Bank building is, which is now Dermis and that Edward Jones uh, business, is uh, Nellie Brown. She's the Western Union Telegraph op operator. She also begins to send telegraphs um, um, asking for help um, to all the neighboring towns. And uh, Leo, Leo C. Daly, I'm sorry, Leo Daly, who's the president of the Chamber of Commerce at the time, um, also is helping her send out um, telegrams. And uh, they stick with that um, as long as they can. The heat from the blaze is starting to make the window um, so hot that she's also fearing, um, fearing for her safety. Um, but she does as many, she, she sends out as many um, telegrams as she can before she leaves, takes her telegraph key with her and goes to the train station at 4th Avenue East and 4th Street and proceeds to send more telegrams um, throughout that day and the next. Uh, she ends up sending out 130 messages on Saturday and receives 100 and then sends out 100, another 165 messages on Sunday and receives 215 before she's finally relieved of duty because she becomes the main communicator for the town. All right, so here's our Spencer Fire Department. Um, and I believe um, this gentleman right here is the fire chief, um, Chief Oscar Stauffer. And it's a primarily volunteer um, fire department. There's a hired driver, but um, otherwise, um, um, Oscar Stauffer is um, 36 years old at the time and fairly new to the department and has been chief for just one year. Um, he and a rookie firefighter, Herb Sorensen, um, are the first um, to, they are the nearest to the, um, or they're the first ones to hear the alarm ring. And Ted Underwood, who's the paid full-time fireman, is the one who, who brings the pumper truck to Fourth and Grand. So. This is when the, the fire department arrives at the scene, and, and you, you may recognize they were just on the scene when the uh, um, telephone operators were coming out of the, out of the window there. Um, anyway, so they quickly rush to the scene and um, park the truck at 4th and Grand and hook up to the, high, the fire hydrant in front of the Cummings Rexall drugstore, which is directly across Main Street from the fire, which is where the bridal, bridal store is now. Um, Uh, they hook up to the hydrant 100 feet across the street to the east, which at the time was free from heat and smoke. As soon as the hydrant was open, they knew there was a problem. There was such a small flow of water, they knew it would be of no use fighting the inferno. At, at the same moment, the wind shifted to the west, and there was a loud explosion at the drugstore, shattering the front window and sending smoke and flames nearly across the wide street. Drove the firefighters back, and their LaFrance fire engine started on fire. They quickly drove the flaming truck away from the blaze and doused it with chemicals to extinguish the flames. The truck's left side suction hose and tires were a bit scorched, but the truck itself was still functioning. It was taken one block to the south and more hose was laid out from the hydrant. At this point, the fire company already had two thirds of their 1,900 feet of two and a half inch hose in use. So there's the Bernstead drugstore engulfed in flame. Um, Already, um, there are firefighters that are trying to go inside Bernstead Drugstore to see if there's more people to rescue. Um, Char Cliff Hodge Hodgen and Charles Flack um, are both knocked down when, there's, when that second explosion happens and uh, are rendered unconscious, brief, unconscious for a brief period of time. Somehow they both escape. And moments, of la moments later, that $75,000 switchboard plunges to the basement um, through the flooring. Um, also at the time of that second large explosion, the awnings of the Rexall, Cummings Rexall drugstore um, start on fire. And the fire crosses Main Street. Um, and so that's Rexall, uh, Cummings Rexall drugstore, the Beehive department store um, begin to burst into flame. Um, so, and what you should know about both of these blocks is um, 
the fire spreads quickly from the Bernstead drugstore to the stores to the north because they have a, um, they don't have any firewalls between buildings and they've even got some integrated um, hallways between those stores, both on main floor and second floor. Well, the same is true um, for the east side of the, of the, of Main Street, where these buildings are built um, to be interconnected. So the flames travel very quickly th through both of these. Uh, so while this is going on, the, f the flames are spreading, the fire um, fighters are still struggling with uh, water pressure um, and hydrants. They've set up another line of hose a block north of the blaze and had only hydrant pressure there. It was almost, it was not in until almost 30 minutes after the blaze started, the firefighters would successfully produce adequate water pressure from the mains and the pumper trucks. Okay. Um, during this time, so there's Cummings Rexall drugstore also engulfed in flames very quickly. And the pavement on Main Street begins to burn. Um, it is asphalt in front of Burnsteads, and it begins to melt and burn. Parts of it even buckle and crack like a furnace grate. Um, there had been discussion in previous months to pour um, concrete, pave Main Street with concrete, but that had not yet happened. So now Main Street is burning. Um, let's see. So next, um, right behind Cummings Rexall on Mill Street, as it was called then, that's First Avenue East, um, is Shoneman's Lumber Company. Um, which happens to have lumber. <laughs> so uh, the, the winds are headed that direction and there's a nice, there's a lot more fuel right there. Um, so um, it's, it, its inventory extended 250 yards to the north and was in grave danger. The southwest west wind was driving the flames from the Cummings block clear out over the roof of the warehouse. One line of hose had been pulled inside the lumber yard and a volunteer crew of townspeople's farmers and lumber yard employees with direction from a retired firefighter was positioned inside the building to protect themselves from the heat while they attempted to keep the blaze at bay. All right. Um, other fire departments had not yet arrived and already the Spencer firefighters were starting to succumb from the heat because remember, um, it's 97 degrees and the wind is blowing. So now they're starting to lose some firefighters. Um, they're, they're starting to succumb. But, um, and in addition, there is a quantity of ammunition on the shelves at Bernstead Drug. So throughout the duration of the blaze, stray bullets shot out of the flames toward the firefighters, and one firefighter was severely cut on the leg by a shell. Um, so um, the, heat, the heat from the blaze is also driving the firefighters further from the flames. They're having a hard time getting, getting near the flames to fight the fire as well. Uh, where am I at? So um, the fire is now continuing down the east side of Main Street um, toward from the Cummings Drugstore to the Nicodemus Building, which is the Beehive, I believe, and uh, I'm starting to lose track here. Um, at that time, it's the K&D Bootery store. Um, then, the, then the wind shifts to the southeast, and the fire starts to spread to the Painter building on the west side, which is the second building north of the Bernstead, Bernstead Hardware. Oh, well, so. So it's, it's basically running north down both sides of, of Main Street at this point, from 4th Street northward. Um, next, after the Nicodemus building on the east side is the Grand Opera House. Um, that's where the um, game stop is now. Um, and um, so the, the Grand Opera House was this um, um, important building to Spencer built in 1900. It was the location of all cultural events. It had fallen under some disrepair um, in recent years, and in fact, a fire marshal had declared it um, unsafe at some point. Um, it was now in some disrepair and ironically had been cited as a hazard in state fire marshal inspections. So this three, large three-story structure of brick and wood fed the blaze on that block even more, and flames shot 100 feet into the air above it. 
Large burning embers were carried downwind to the roofs of other buildings to the north. So again, more fuel for this fire. Um, let's see, and then past, um, again, we're going north on, on um, the east side of Main Street. Um, this is now at um, East 5th and Main, um, the, which is now like where Jimmy John's is. Um, this is the William Steele Clothing Company. Um, the, the other building um, that I didn't mention after the Grand Opera House um, was actually where Twetton Furniture Company was at the time. That's now where Stefan Furniture is. Um, that also was in flame. And it was a furniture store, so there was more, um, more fuel for the fire. Um, oh, that's right. And that the William Steele, when the, once the William Steele clothing store started on fire, um, that's where Marie Banning, the telephone operator's apartment is. So she's about to lose everything she owns. Okay. So then the wind shifted again, and more things are burning on the east side. Um, the wind seems stronger now, and the block north of Fifth, nearly all wood frame buildings, was all that stood between the main fire and the pump and water supply north of the railroad tracks. So within 45 minutes of the first alarm, all the buildings that were ultimately lost to the fire were already ablaze. So this was traveling very fast. All right. And so this is um, East Fifth and Mill, which is, is First Avenue East. Um, uh, motor, Mona Motors and Vanderhoff Service Station are also up in flame. All right, so finally, about 4.15, um, some of the first fire crews are making it to Spence. Remember, the, the, the blaze started around 3 p.m. Um, the first uh, crew to arrive is Milford. Um, 14 miles to the north. Um, they um, were known throughout the region for their quick response to any alarms. Two of members of their crew, the Donaldson brothers, were race car drivers. So uh, they <laughs> prided themselves on getting, getting, uh, getting to fires quickly. Um, though they first misunderstood their orders and sent a, a truck to the home of Harry Spencer in Milford and then had to uh, correct and head, head uh, south to Spencer Spencer. And they arrived around uh, somewhere between 4.15 and 4.30. Um, and then the fire crews from then on um, started arriving, and they mostly arrived between 4.30 and 7 p.m. that night. Um, they, as you can see from the list, many, many responses. Um, the Milford crew came first, and I, I'm not sure. That's almost order, order of arrival, um, because I know Storm Lake and, and Sac City arrived fairly late in the, um, and uh, they, um, and this was really the test for young Oscar Stauffer, who was pretty new to being fire chief. He then had the duty of directing all these crews where to go, um, which was no easy task. Um, and so he, I, I've got, I, you know, like the, Let's see. And, and remember, they're still having trouble with water pressure. Um, they've, now sent, they've now sent a pumper truck to the large water reservoir at the light plant that's north of the railroad tracks. And I think it must be in about the area of the, the current um, Spencer Utilities. Um, and so they're pumping, they're pumping water from that reserve. And they briefly stop a train on the railroad tracks because they've got the hose running over the tracks. They eventually dig under it, I guess, and then run the hose under it so people can, so the train can go, I guess. And, uh, and um, then, let's see, so, let's see. So, and so Oscar Stauffer has to, to direct all these crews. He sends Everly and Hartley crews to work to save Shoneman's lumber, which they mostly do, despite all that lumber sitting there right behind Rexall Cummings. Um, Spirit Lake and some Emmitsburg um, crews work on the west side on just north of Burnsteads, um, where they do manage to stop the blaze at the what's called the Kunath Building, which I believe is where um, um, the soccer, the uh, goal, kick. goal kick is located. Thank you. That Kunath Building had a firewall, and it was also a. Is it, I believe it's no. Is it a? Is there a one-story building next to it? The, the, somehow the Spirit Lake um, fire 
chief stands on a roof to try to fight that fire and for the most part stops it there. Um, and then um, Sheldon arrives around 5 p.m. and they are sent to the Little Sioux River um, with their uh, pump to pump water from the Little Sioux River into the city mains. Um, this happens to then contaminate the water supply for all of Spencer's, you know, the drinking water supply for all of Spencer's residents, but it provides some water um, for the fire. So that's what Sheldon does. And if you, this is a side note, a personal, it's not in the book. Um, if you knew Joe Carroll, um, owner of Carroll's Bakery, he was a little boy of about, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember, he was a couple years older. Um, he maybe was seven or so, seven or eight. He told me he sat down by the river and watched them pump water out of the river. That's where he was during the fire. And his parents told him not to go any closer than that. So he was a few blocks away. Um, let's see, what do we have? So here's a, here's a look. So this is looking south down Main Street. I think this must have been taken from the Tangy Hotel because of the, the height. Um, so, let's see. So this, you know, this I think is the Grand Opera House, which is where GameStop is now. Um, and then this is like where um, Jimmy John's is now. This is the Spencer Theater. And then, you know, over here is Bernstead Drug on the west side of the street. But, um, yeah, the other, another little story here at the um, Spencer Theater, right after the, you know, once the flame breaks out, there's people in there watching a movie, oh. and they smell smoke, <laughs> and have no idea what's going on, but eventually leave the theater um, uh, and come outside to see, you know, Main Street burning. Um, the other thing is, um, because of the strong winds, there are people in the neighborhood where, near where Fairway is now, that are actually up on their roofs with garden hoses, um, putting out bl um, blazing embers that are flying that far. Um, start, you know, and, and, and as far as I know, no homes were lost, no homes caught fire, but that, you know, there were people fighting, fighting flaming embers that were landing as far as past Fairway. So let's see, what else? Um, and of course, it was Saturday afternoon, so there were all kinds of people in town shopping. And uh, so everyone was um, gathered around looking. So if you can recognize that, that the, um, oops, sorry. The, this building here is the, the old Farmer's Bank building, but you know it is the Edward Jones Dermis building. So everybody's gathered right there, you know, and all the fire, this is Burnstead's and all the fire is going to the north. but. You can imagine all these crowds um, looking on while the firefighters are trying to do their job. Um, this is um, where the piano store is. I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, Midwest Piano on Fifth and Grand on the west side. So this is this. Yeah, there you go, Eddie Quinn's for some of us that are older. So this is Fifth Street, and we're looking toward Grand. So this building would be the what we know as the Jimmy John's building, and this is Midwest Piano. So again, we've got all kinds of onlookers, you know, while firefighters are setting up to battle the blaze. All right, so in the meantime, um, in Des Moines at 5.02 p.m., the city editor of the Des Moines Register picks up his telephone to hear, this is the Milwaukee Railroad. We have a message from Spencer for you which reads, Town is burning. Send plane with dynamite and fire chief. Water pressure is gone. <laughs> so, um, and this is, this is to me the funny part about this fire is that suddenly, you know, there, there's, there's a thinking that you can use dynamite to cause a fire break, um, to put out a fire. Um, and so suddenly everyone's being called for dynamite. Um, so not only does the, this is the Des Moines Register's um, plane that they have at the time, the Good News 2. So they load the Good News 2 up with, with um, dynamite. Is, it a, is this the 150 pounds of dry, of dynamite? I mean, 150 pounds of dynamite. Um, there's also the register then arranges via telegram to have um, dynamite sent to Spencer from Primgar. And so a truckload is on its way from Primgar at about that same time. 
Also, a wholesale explosive dealer in Mason City, 100 miles away, has also been alerted by the Register and Tribune staff for the need of explosives and has promptly dispatched a truckload of expos explosives around 5.30 p.m. Um, another Mason City man, Archie Peterson, would leave Mason City around the same time in his plane loaded with 130 pounds of dynamite. So there's a lot of dynamite heading to Spencer <laughs> at around 5 o'clock. Um, yeah, and then also Earl Hall, uh, editor of the Mason City Globe Gazette, has managed to have a fire truck loaded onto a railroad car ready to send to Spencer if the need arises. Um, so, you know, in that regard, there's communities all over are trying to help Spencer. Um, so this is the aerial view of the fire from the Good News, Good News 2. Um, they, that plane arrives around 6.30, so that's, that's what they see from the Good News 2. Um, I, I think you can, I, this is Bernstead Drug, this is Cummings Rexall, and then, you know, this is the smoke and flame to the north. Though, um, as I understand it, by around 6 p.m., the fires are mostly in control they're still smoking and they're still um, watering, I mean, they're still throwing water on everything, but the flames are mostly in control by around 6 p.m., according to Oscar Stauffer. Um, he was not convinced that dynamiting was the way to go and thought he had, had control of things, because by then a lot of those volunteer fire departments were already on scene, but um, he was convinced otherwise, and um, they used the Spencer dry cleaners building as the as the place to dynamite um, and the dry cleaners so the dry cleaners are on the oops sorry they're on the east side of the street and i'm going to say they're somewhere down south of or i'm sorry north of like anytime fitness um between Anytime Fitness and Pizza Ranch, and I'm sorry, I can't give you a, a better location than that. They're mid-block somewhere there. Um, and so they've already um, emptied out all their customers' um, clothing and, and rugs and things. They, all the merchants in the meantime are scurrying, the, that know they're in the path of this fire, and they're, they're taking all their goods out of their stores and, and putting them on trucks or putting them in the alley or, or whatever. And so the dry cleaners has, emptied their store of all their customers' goods, but they've got all their dry cleaning equipment is still in there. And so, let's see. Okay, there you go. Um, the dry cleaners, I think, is this building. And so, I th up here, huh, I'm not, now I'm, I think that that is, yeah, because, no? That, that, so I'm not sure where the theater is from, from this location. Anybody? That does not, that, sh that looks like it should be the theater, but I'm not sure if I recognize it. But the, I think this is the dry cleaner. Because there it goes. That's, they dynamite the dry cleaners. Well, the, again, the fire was mostly already stopped, but that, you know, I guess that stopped it for good. There was no f fire past that. Um, and so the thing is, then all this dynamite was in Spencer. So another another um, story about that then is um, there were a lot of um, burned out stores who had big, tall brick walls that were precarious and about to fall. And um, the Bernstead drugstore burned the longest because it had all the paint and um, hardware supplies in its basement. And so, um, as I understand it, they used a load of dynamite to knock down the south wall of Bernstead Drug. And when I used to do this presentation for school age kids, I'd tell them anytime you're stopped at Fourth and Grand, look to, to the south at the, at the north wall of the Farmer's Bank building, and there are chips out of that out of that stone. Um, and when they set that dynamite off to knock down that, that uh, south wall of Bernstead Drug, they shattered every window on the north side of the farmer's bank because they, they had a lot of dynamite, so they were using a lot of it. All right, so they continue to hose down the ruins. Um, so there you see, there you see that wall. Um, where am I at? This is that big wall of Bernstead Drug because that's farmer's bank. Um, 
These are the ruins on the east side. So that, you can see, that's the, the movie theater. And so I'm thinking down here is the dry cleaners. Um, and everything continues to smoke. Um, that's, that's the opera house, the tall building. And you can see how, how oops, sorry, devastated you know, the, the other buildings to the south are. You know, on that corner, those are completely gone very quickly. More ruins, east side of Main Street. Ruins, west side, so that's, so you can see where they stopped the blaze. Um, you know, it didn't really travel that far north on the west side of the, of the street. Another aerial view of the ruins, which really gives you, you know, a look of the, the devastation. And just so you can also locate yourself, here's the, the, the old uh, high school, then middle school, now apartments. Here's the Masonic Temple, I think. Um, and that's, I think that's. Uh, the courthouse would be down, down here somewhere. Maybe we can't see it. All right. So this is the, by the very next day, um, well, yeah, the other thing to, to keep in mind is, you know, they, they continue to, you know, they continue to um, hose, hose down all the, the ruins all into the night. And uh, that night, that Saturday night, um, Spencer, the Spencer residents went, went to sleep with no potable drinking water um, and no elect, hardly any electricity and no telephone service. Um, you know, it was a... It was a bad day for Spencer. So bright and early the next morning, um, the owners are, are looking at the wreckage. Um, oh, that's right. And on that Sunday, so they, they, they estimated that on that Saturday of the blaze, there were, by the end of the evening, there were 10,000 people in Spencer that had come to watch the blaze. And on Sunday, there were 30 to 50,000 people that traveled through Spencer to look at the, look at the ruins. <laughs> which really wasn't that helpful for everyone, but uh, all right. And so I guess by Monday then, by Monday then, the owners are looking at their property. Um, temporary structures are starting to be built. Um, the bank vault um, is uh, eventually open. There, there's, there's a bunch of different stories about what, what the different merchants do and, and try to protect their stuff. A whole bunch of the, the Clay County Bank that's, that's right next door or two doors down from Bernstead Drug, they, the tellers throw all their, all their money and, and um, all, all the bonds and everything into that safe and it all survives. Um, they open that up when the safe cools down. Oh, let's see. Steve what. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and these are the Fred Moore and H. A. Finkelstein at the Salon Theater, which is becomes the Spencer Theater. Um, they are, and they become the. I think they're the very first people that declare that they're rebuilding. Um, and Bernstead Drug puts up temporary buildings, and um, you can see that is also. It, they're on the so they're on the the south side of Fourth Street because this is the Farmers Bank building again, and that's the Medler Studio, the Yellow Tile building. So they build these temporary quarters. A side note: my dad, who was six years old at the time, has a memory of coming in with his dad and buying a winter coat at the at that temporary building at Bernstead's. Um, and then this is a temporary structure you can see right here by the Cummings Rexall Drug Building. Also. Um, so that's on East 4th Street, on the, on the north side of that street. And this is the uh, police station at the time, which escapes the blaze, which is a, which is a very good thing, um, given that Spencer was in darkness um, and ruin, um, that we didn't lose our police department. All right, so um, yeah, so the rest of the story is the, um, the people of Spencer, um, this uh, Leo C. Daly of the commercial club um, and uh, the, the mayor and um, a lot of the business owners um, really do spring into action and start planning um, to, build, to build back the downtown. Not all the insurance, um, not everything was covered by insurance, but a lot of it was. And they united for a, um, 
uh, they did a united design and um, found that there were um, savings to be had by using similar building materials and ordering it in bulk. Um, they, they really did band together um, to, to build back Spencer. And it sounds to me from all the articles, certainly of the articles I read in the paper, that there was never a hesitation, that they, they got together and, and decided to, to build back. Um, let's see. So um, within 10 days of the blaze, plans were near completion for seven new structures in the fire district, and some contracts had already been let. These buildings represented $500,000 worth of investment in a new and better Spencer. A city planning commission had been organized to oversee a unified design and construction. construction. Leading the group were Walter H. Thomas, Spencer banker and Fred Moore property owner. He was the, the theater owner. Um, other, other members you might know, Wilson Cornwall, Redfield, Rasmussen, William Flint. And um, there were city planning engineer from Des Moines um, and an extension engineer from Iowa State College in Ames. They were all sent to Spencer to help. Uh, what else? And uh, it was in an article titled Building for Value, printed in the Daily Reporter July 16th, so just a couple weeks later. L.H. Murphy pointed out that the many advantages of a unified design for a downtown district. He reminded the property owners that they had an opportunity that few other Iowa towns had had to build a large business district together, creating a harmonious whole that would be very attractive, distinctive, economic, I'm sorry, economic and a business asset. Not only would the new business district be very attractive, but it would give the impression of solidarity and business strength, which would draw and hold business. Finally, Murphy did, reminded the property owners that this same uniform design of building would make for a cooperative buying of building materials. This type of quantity buying would result in real savings. Co cooperation here will mean money, said Murphy. So uh, anyway, um, and then among the building, among the new provisions for the building code was were 12 inch thick walls for one and two story buildings. Um, taller buildings were subject to special permits. Um, fire walls, fireproof walls would have to extend at least three feet above the roof of the building. Wood joists would be permitted, but no more than 24 inches apart, protected by gypsum, plaster, and concrete. Stairways and elevators must be enclosed and protected. Um, so all new um, building codes went into place, fireproof building codes. Um, what else? So I could I could go on and on, but the, well, all this happened very quickly. The new Spencer Theater opened on September 3rd of that year, um, which to me is still amazing that that was that happened. And then there were 20 new buildings in the Spencer um, in the Spencer Business District that popped up. So this is the the reconstruction. Um, there was a, again, this was during the Depression, so a lot of unemployed young men flocked to Spencer looking for work, and it got to the point that the mayor put out a declaration that said, do not come to Spencer, we don't need any more help. But, you know, it was the Depression and people were looking for work, and, and this did provide a lot of jobs for people. Um, and then by December 11th, um, they had their um, jubilee which all these, all these 20 new buildings um, were up and running um, by Spencer 10th, and they decorated the town for the holidays. It's a little hard to see, I'm trying to think. So this is Main Street, and I am, th I am thinking we're looking south, and this is taken from the Tangney again. Um, this is, I think this is the um, the building where Stefan or where yeah Stefan Furniture is. Anybody? No. No, this might. I'm, I apologize. I know this is I know this is Burnstead, where where Hen House is now. Um, yep, Midwest Piano. Yep. Um, that might be actually where um, Stefan, it, Stefan Furniture, Carol's Bakery, might be right there. And then this is Cummings Rexall, right? There's the Clay County National Bank, which then became um, Cornwall, Avery, Burnstead, Scott, yep. And there's the 
Flint Cummings Rasmussen block, which is where the bridal store is now. And then right next to that, the, where the beehive is. And um, this is Arts on Grand, I believe that was the Fraser Theater prior to that. And then this is the famous floaty, Thomas Floaty Building where GameStop is that was, you know, J.C. Penney's how I knew it for a lot of years. So this is after reconstruction, um, looking south. And this is after the reconstruction, looking north. That's it. Um, yeah, that's a, if I remember right, anybody? I think that's a, I was. Was there not a light there too? A traffic light? Okay, so I'll finish this up with a, a little more. How are we doing on time? Um, so in, in 2004, um, flash, fast forward to 2004, um, an application was made and accepted to place much of Spencer's downtown business district on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, what, from a historic perspective, what makes the Spencer downtown so significant be, can be explained in three parts. First, it illustrates the development of the commercial district of a county seat by community planning in the rebuilding of the central business district after a major fire. It represents the coordinated effort by individual architects, builders, and owners to work with planners to create a modern and cosmopolitan commercial area, most of it occurring during a specific period in 1931. Secondly, the Grand Avenue Historic Commercial District was, has statewide significance because the Spencer Fire was directly responsible for the law passed by the Iowa State Legislature in 1937, seven, banning the sale of fireworks in the entire state of Iowa. And finally, the district is significant in that the buildings illustrate most of the popular styles used for early 20th century, century commercial design. These modern designs include I'm sorry, these modern buildings constructed in the post-fire period. They include designs between 1913 and 1935. Um, the following architectural classifications are represented. Late Victorian Romanesque, revi Romanesque revival, late 19th, early 20th century revival, such as classical revival, Mission Spanish revival and Italian Renaissance, late 19th, early 20th century American movements such as Sylvanesque, Chicago style, and commercial style, and modern movements such as Art Deco. Um, and I'll close with um, another paragraph. Um, Without the dramatic event of the, Spence, of the fire in Spencer, no doubt Spencer's commercial district would have followed the ways of so many other Midwestern towns. A small, a mixture of pre-1900 bricks would stand alongside a variety of post-1900 to present buildings constructed, constructed in any type of material or roof line with no overall plan for architectural integrity or visual continuity. The men and women who so quickly and efficiently got together to forge a vision of Spencer's Main Street and its future should be remembered as well as people who saw beyond the movement the moment of disaster and look forward to an opportunity to do something distinctive for their community that would live on into their grandchildren's generation and beyond. All right, and that's what I've got. Um, thank you. Yes, I would if, if people don't aren't okay. floating away. There is one right there. When I was younger, I used to have reading lessons with you and Jane. Her, her, she was the mother of the F. who was a long time yes. teacher. Yes. And she always told me that the identity of the young boy who started the fireworks was a mystery, but it was a very well kept secret because this person was a, I think because he was a prominent businessman in the city. Is that what do you know about the identity of the yeah. mystery person? So, I, I, well, I don't care. Go ahead and say what you want well, to say. Uh, in kind of response to that, when I first came to town, I worked with Ryan Gibbs, and I Wayne Hurd as one of the partners. Mm -hmm. And one day at coffee, we were talking about the fire. And one of the people, one of the people at the, uh, they're sitting around the coffee table, asked Wayne Hurd if he knew who started the fire and where he, where was he? He got up and left the room and wouldn't refuse to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. 
Um, yeah, I did a lot of, I mean, at the end of the book, I talk about all the different, there's a, I, I only use published, sort of mostly published um, material to, to comment on that. And when I wrote this book, I had a couple of people, I can think of one woman who I, can thankfully don't know what her name was that at a book signing came up to me and she said, you better not have told who that boy was that started the fire. <laughs> and she was mad. And I said, you know, I left it as a we don't know because different newspapers had one, it was a sandy haired boy, another one it was a dark haired boy. Um, then supposedly this um, uh, Kilpatrick yeah. came back to town and told Otto Bernstead Jr. I think it was at the 20th, anniversary or something 50s or I don't remember 50th that said that said that he had done it I interviewed uh, someone else um, who's now passed on who I had a, a few elders that I talked to off the record when I was writing this just to ask about sort of what do you think of this or I read this in the paper or somebody told me this um, she said oh it wasn't Billy Kilpatrick he did <laughs> I knew him he would never he didn't do it he was and then I, I looked and I looked him up and he wasn't of an age they mostly said it was a young a young boy, but he would have been like 11 during the, the fire. But there's a lot of different um, there's a lot of different um, stories around it. And I, I presented at the Golden K in 2006, and it's the funniest story. An older gentleman came up afterwards. He goes, "I know who did it," and he wrote it on a piece of paper on the table that I had my notes on. And I, I somebody else was talking to me when he did it. I lost that piece of paper. I mean, <laughs> or somebody else took it, or I don't know. But, so but still, I, I, I still don't know. It's still I, a mystery. I, I love that part of the story that we don't really know. Although I, I know, I know people who have passed on that told me they knew, but they weren't going to yeah. tell me. So uh, Claire Wheeler knew. I know that she was a friend of mine. Uh, Claire Cornwall Wheeler. Yeah. One one story I remember you were telling was about the Storm Lake fire chief, mm -hmm. and we had him all set to come and yeah. do the 75th. Tell that story, would you? So Harold Stanton was the fire chief from Storm Lake. Um, and if I remember right, he was a young man that had been foisted into being the, the fire chief down there. Um, and he was still living at the 75th um, anniversary. And um, I actually went down there with my brother, Kirby Schmidt, and Robin Larson from City Hall. And um, we interviewed him. He was in a nursing home in Storm Lake. and. Um, uh, you know, he, he had a few things to say about some of the other fire chiefs that were also at the fire. Um, <laughs> Which will not be repeated well, here. <laughs> I don't remember. I think I sort of gently said some, you know, if I had little personality bits about people that someone had told me, I included that in the book. But he was a funny guy, and yeah, he was supposed to have come to the parade for the 75th, and he, had, he passed away before that happened. But, uh, yeah. Some people will do anything about appearing at a, ne never mind. <clears throat> um, anything else? Julie, any, any other questions? Okay. Uh, if you need a copy of the book, over here we have books for sale. Merlin will take your money. 15 bucks, is that right? Okay. And uh, <clears throat> I just want to tell you uh, what's coming up next. Next Tuesday, <clears throat> Kirby Schmidt will be here. He'll be talking about the Sanborn maps. That insurance company um, had maps of most every town in America, and uh, they, they're here somewhere, and they're very interesting. They were done way back turn of the century, I guess, uh, the previous century. Anyway, <clears throat> Kirby will be here next Tuesday. And a week from tonight will be the final, and that will be Jeremy Parsons talking about the Clay County Fair. So uh, with that, Julie, thank you for your presentation. Very, very interesting. I learn something new all the time. And uh, thank you all for being here. And remember, if you need a book, it's here. Good night, everybody.